Namaste. <laughs> well, here we are with the uh, Essence of Dharma Special Swimsuit Edition. <laughs> now we're down at the old swimming hole. See, this is where the monks take bath in the morning. So, as you can see, this uh, forest life is terribly austere. <laughs> I'm just down here doing my laundry. And uh, the question came up. I was discussing with someone the topics that we've been talking about recently. Let me go up here and sit down in the shade. Ah. And the question came up. How does all this about the Buddha's teaching, Sankara and so on, fit into the framework of Shiva and Shakti that we're discussing in the uh, Devi Kalotara? Well, it fits very nicely. To show how it fits exactly, let's go back to the Buddha's story of his uh, Buddhahood, how he became a Buddha. And, you know, he was very austere, traveling around, almost starving to death, doing severe austerities for, I think, seven years. And then he sat down under the bow tree and he decided, this is it, I'm going to make it or else. Enlightenment or bust. So it's described that he was meditating. What was he meditating on? Exactly what we've been talking about here. The law of dependent arising, paticca samupada, and the link between sankhara, preparations, fabrications, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> sankhara, <laughs> and conditioned consciousness. And the last night of his meditation, Maya herself came and served him. Now, who is Maya? Shakti. And who is Shakti? The wife of Shiva. And why is she serving Buddha? Because Buddha was in the state of Shivam. Now remember, <laughs> we are all originally Shiva. We're all originally the self. There is no such thing as an individual, as a separate living being. That's the teaching of Advaita from the Upanishads. So, therefore, if we are all Shiva, then we all can get Shakti to serve us, and we do all the time. This body is Shakti. This conditioned consciousness that we have, beginning with I am, this is Shakti. We went over that a few verses back, that Shiva is the I factor and Shakti is the am factor. So she is the beingness of individual existence, of conditioned life in the material world. And he is Ishwara, the controller. He tells her, Shakti, I want to do this. I want to go here. I want to do that. I want this experience or that experience. And she arranges it for him. Well, what does that sound like? Sankara. Isn't it? The intention to assume a particular form of being. So Shiva, it's described, or actually Brahman, before differentiation. It's described in the Upanishads. Brahman says, I am one. Let me become many. So the first division of Brahman is into two. Brahman is one. Then he becomes two, Shiva and Shakti. And Shakti is Maya. She can arrange any kind of illusory, 
a dream existence, uh, even if it's impossible, uh, even if the Brahman, one Brahman becomes many, she can do it. And it's described that the Brahman becoming many is like the moon being reflected in many, many little puddles after a rain. There's one moon, but that same moon is reflected in innumerable small puddles. Or, another example is, there are many pots, and there's the space inside the pot, which is limited, and the space outside the pot, which is unlimited. Actually, space is one. There's no distinction, no difference between the space inside and outside the pot, huh? except from our limited point of view. We say this is inside the pot, this is outside the pot. But actually, it's the same space. That's all. So the same way, um, Brahman is one, but he is reflected in many, many bodies, in many, many individual existences. Now, because this existence, this individual consciousness, is illusory, it doesn't really exist. When we say existence, what we really mean is illusion, maya. And when we say self-realization, what we really mean is real existence. Shiva or Brahman. So, there's a wonderful quote Michael McClure brought up from Paramedes. That what is unborn really is. What is born never was. Because what is born has a beginning. And prior to that beginning, it was not. And then it was, and then again it disappears, and it was not. So really, it was not. <laughs> it only appeared to be. Whereas the unborn, the void, unconditioned awareness, Brahman, always exists unconditionally. That's the reality. So what happens is that Shiva hmm, wants to play. So he says, okay, let me become many. Shakti, I want to take on this identity and that identity and so many other identities. I want to become Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, and create and populate the worlds. She says, okay, honey. <laughs> Remember, she has no ego. So she sets it up for him, but she does it in such a way that he will have to come out of it eventually. And that's what we're doing. That's self-realization. That is Shiva waking up to who he really is. So when Shiva becomes an individual and comes under the influence of Maya, Maya means what is not. Uh, ma, that which, ya, is not. So maya <laughs> is arranging so many apparent individual existences for Shiva to experience conditioned life. So he goes to maya, I want to take this kind of being, I want to take that kind of being, I want to enter into this kind of body or this kind of experience or whatever. These are all Sankara. So Shiva's name is Sankara. Shiva Sankara, isn't it? It's not, it's not a coincidence. It has deep meaning. So if we want to come out of it and regain our original position, our, ex our original being, real being, huh, all we have to do is stop telling Shakti to make us some conditioned existence. All we have to do is, is stop telling her, I want to take on this being, or I want to take on that kind of body, or I want to be in this kind of cir circumstance or situation or experience or whatever. Because all of them are conditioned. All of them are temporary, 
unsatisfactory, and not self. Those are the three qualities of the world. But we go into them with the illusion or the expectation that they are eternal, that they are going to be pleasing, and that they're going to be our self. Isn't it? That's Maya. <laughs> what is not? So, the sadhana that leads to directly to enlightenment. Now, this is the direct path. No more messing around. <laughs> Get right down to it. The sadhana is to stop as far as possible creating new sankharas that result in conditioned being or conditioned consciousness. And as far as the ones that we can't stop, because they have some du long duration, like the body or like the concept of individuality and so on. We try to displace them with the Dhamma, the Dharma, the Buddha's teaching, the Vedic teaching, the sadhana, hmm? that let me attain self-realization. That becomes the dominant Sankhara in the mind of the sadhu. And then from that sankhara displaces so many other minor sankharas. And over time, or actually can happen very quickly, that becomes the only sankhara. And then that one is also given up. Like the Buddha said, when you reach the other shore, you let go of the raft. So this is the process and this is where it leads. Uh, it leads to this natural, unconditioned, pure, original, non-dual, <laughs> non-individual. Uh, and it's more than consciousness; it's pure awareness. Non-dual, objectless awareness. That's self-realization. Now. That's the way Mahara, uh, Maharshi Ramana would describe it. That's the Vedic terminology, which is positivist. Buddha, he never described Nibbana, Nirvana. Uh, his teaching is apophatic, which means negativist. It talks around the goal. It never describes the goal. It only tells you how to reach it. So if you follow the instructions, uh, a Buddhist teaching is called Opanayaka, meaning come and see. See, he's not going to tell you exactly what, what you're going to experience. Huh? He's going to give you the tools, give you the method, and come and see for yourself. Huh? You can work it out. Any wise person, any person who's beyond ignorance can work it out for themselves and experience the result. So that's the connection. See, at the top of the mountain, the two paths, the positivist and the negativist, converge. And from this point of view, there really is no difference, <laughs> no duality. <laughs> and when you sit in that awareness, that's instant enlightenment. See, the Zen people are right. Enlightenment happens in a flash. As soon as you get it, as soon as you understand this teaching, as soon as you get this jnana, huh? of course, then you still have to live out the karma of this body, which you created. Huh? So you have to own it and live it out to its destiny. But that's all right, because now you know the reality. You know how it really is. And because you worked it out all for yourself, nobody can ever take that understanding away from you. Nobody can ever convince you that that's not true. Because you came to it by your own insight. And that's what you have to do. Look, we've been talking about this stuff from the very first videos on this channel. The Foundation Series. Go back, take a look at it. Go to the playlist page, all the way down at the bottom, you'll find the foundation series. And 
one of the videos is in the process of becoming. And it's exactly Paticca Samupada, exactly what we're talking about here. So go back, review all that stuff, learn it, and then come back and look at the Maharshi Ramana series and, and the later series, and you'll see that they form complementary views of the same teaching, the same realization, the same reality. Huh? So, okay, I'm really done now. <laughs> This is the last, last, final, final, ultimate video. <laughs> I've said it all. I can't say more than this. It's not possible. I may come back later. I may not. I don't know. You know, I'm just going to jump into this uh, experience of this teaching uh, fully and not hold anything back and see where it takes me, see where I wind up. <laughs> it's pretty good so far. So uh, it's probably going to work out just fine. Om Tat Sat Aung Harihi Aung. <laughs>